Discord's secret database formula. In 2017, Discord released an article explaining how exactly they were storing billions of messages. They started their journey with MongoDB, but then migrated to Cassandra database because they were looking for a database that was scalable, fault tolerant, and relatively low maintenance. If you never heard of Cassandra, it's a NoSQL database, which means it doesn't use the traditional table structure found in SQL database. This can make Cassandra more flexible and easier to use for certain types of data. And traditionally, Cassandra was designed to be highly scalable and easily distributed across the whole system to be able to deal with large amounts of data. So the use cases would be, for example, storing machine learning data sets, a lot of log level data, and for example, messages, like in the case of Discord. So obviously Discord wanted a database that could grow with the number of messages that they have but still keep the maintenance needs low. Unfortunately though, this did not turn out to be the case as Cassandra exhibited very, very bad performance issue. So how did Discord exactly solve this issue? Well, that's what we're gonna learn in this video. And alongside that, we're also gonna learn about systems design, databases and migrations. So if you're interested in that, let's get started. So back in 2017, when Discord released this article, they had 12 nodes of Cassandra storing their billions of messages. At the beginning of 2022 though, they went up to 177 nodes of Cassandra. And this was obviously storing trillions of messages now. This was obviously a high toil system that needed a lot of maintenance and on-call people, meaning that if the database or some node goes down, the customers are complaining, somebody has to always be there 24 seven, somebody from the employees to be able to come to the office and fix that issue. But what exactly was causing these issues? Let's dive a bit deeper. Since Cassandra was storing billions, trillions of messages, they had to somehow partition this huge database because otherwise if you had one huge database, it's gonna get slow you need to be able to divide your databases in meaningful chunks. And this is called partitioning. So partitioning is the process of dividing a database into smaller, more manageable units called partitions or shards. It can be applied to various levels between the database hierarchy, such as tables, indexes, or even individual roles. What Discord did is they partitioned their database based on a specific channel. So all the messages within one channel will be living in one partition of the database and also replicated across three different nodes for fault tolerance. So basically the goal of partitioning is to improve performance, scalability and data management. And there's also another term called sharding. So what's the difference between partitioning and sharding? Sharding is a specific form of partitioning that involves distributing data across multiple servers or nodes in a database cluster. Each server or node in the cluster is responsible for a subset of the data. In a summary, partitioning focuses on dividing a database into smaller units for performance optimization and data management, whereas sharding is a specific type of partitioning that emphasizes horizontal scalability by distributing data across multiple servers or nodes. But within partitioning, there is a specific issue that Discord ran into. So if we're partitioning a database based on channels, for example, one channel is living in one partition, what if this specific channel is very, very popular? Let's say it's a channel about Minecraft, which means it's gonna get a lot of user requests and the pressure on this partition is gonna be much higher compared to other partitions. Well, if there's more pressure on a partition, why don't we just scale this partition? Well, the thing is, it's not only about that. In Cassandra, reading the data from the database is more expensive than writing into the database. Writes are appended to a commit log and written to a memory structure called memtable that is eventually flushed to the disk. Let's hang on this for a bit so that you have a better picture. The memtable within Cassandra, short for memory table, is an in-memory data structure that serves as a write buffer for incoming data before it is flushed to the disk. But why does Cassandra even have a mem table? Writing data to an in-memory data structure like mem table is much faster compared to writing directly to the disk. So by buffering writes in the memory, Cassandra can minimize the frequency of these disk flush operations. Reads, however, need to query the mem table and potentially multiple 
SS tables on disk files, which is a more expensive operation. And let's say if users interact a lot with a specific partition of the database, we're gonna call this partition a hot partition. And while Cassandra is optimized for very fast writes, ad hoc read queries are very, very slow. If you're interested in learning how exactly Discord could have optimized the usage of Cassandra beforehand, make sure to give this video a like. And as soon as it reaches 100 likes, I'm gonna make a follow-up explaining exactly that. So as soon as there was a hot partition within the system, it frequently affected latency across the entire database cluster. So since the user of this Minecraft channel would make a lot of reads and writes to this partition with the quorum consistency level, all queries to the node would suffer very, very high latency and result in a broader user impact. I mentioned a term called quorum consistency level. What exactly is that? The quorum consistency level means it needs acknowledgement from 51% or a majority of replica nodes across all data centers. Meaning if you have one partition replicated many times, the 51% of these nodes need to acknowledge that, for example, a write has been happened to mark this operation as complete. There will be links in the description if you wanna learn more about it. So again, what did Discord do to overcome this issue? Well, in their previous post, they said that they were trying to migrate to ScyllaDB, which is an alternative to Cassandra written in C++, and therefore would be a bit faster than Cassandra. So after experimenting with ScyllaDB, they finally made a decision to migrate to it from Cassandra. Well, they did migrate everything except for the messages. Well, because they had many other databases, but the main one, of course, where they stored the messages still stayed in Cassandra. What's the reason for that? Well, because it's not easy to migrate things. Cassandra database that stores all of these messages was very, very huge and migration would be just painful. So obviously developers wanted to avoid that pain. And also the developers wanted to gain a bit more experience and tune the performance of ScyllaDB, which is very smart. So the messages are still living in Cassandra, means we're still having the old issue, but the developers at Discord managed to find a way around it. If our hot partitions are getting a lot of requests, let's say in a huge Minecraft channel, somebody posts a message and tens of thousands of other users are seeing this message and they're reading it from the database, How, what can you do to reduce this pressure on the server? Well, obviously you can introduce an extra layer before your database that can cache these incoming requests that are similar. To accomplish this task, they build something called data services, at least that's what, how they call it. And it's a monolith API that sits before the database clusters. And it's basically an intermediary service that sits between their API monolith and the database clusters. And for this, they used Rust. Actually, Rust is known for being quite fast and especially when using it for networking. And to make their life easier, they used the ecosystem called Tokyo. Tokyo has a tremendous foundation for building network applications. Basically, it can solve any problem that you have when it comes to networking. So what exactly did they do with Rust? Well, something called request coalescing, meaning if multiple users are requesting the same row of the table, there will be only one query to the database. The first user that makes a request causes a worker task to spin up the service and the subsequent request will check for the existence of this task and subscribe to it. That worker task will query the database and return the row to all subscribers. So you see that it's not really like caching, but it sounds similar to caching. I think it's much smarter than caching. And the second part of magic here is the upstream of their data services. They implemented consistent hash-based routing to their data services to enable more effective coalescing. For each request to their data service, they provide a routing key. For messages, this is a channel ID. So all requests for the same channel go to the same instance of the service. This routing further helps to reduce the load on the database. While these improvements helped a lot, of course they didn't solve all the problems. They were still seeing hot partitions and increased latency at some point of time. So the migration to ScyllaDB was inevitable. So the requirements for the migration were somewhat straightforward. They needed to move all the data while having no downtime. Well, step one, 
This one is easy. Just provision a new SillaDB instance. And by using local SSDs for speed and leveraging RAID to mirror their data to a persistent disk, they get this speed and durability that they wanted. RAID refers to redundant array of independent disks, which is a technology used to improve data storage performance, reliability, and fault tolerance. The first stage of RAID is called mirroring. This level duplicates data across multiple disks, providing redundancy. If one disk fails, the data can still be accessed from the mirrored disk, which is ideal for large migration. So the very first draft of this migration was designed to give results pretty quickly. They started migrating the incoming new data to SillaDB and migrate the old one slowly, step by step. Well, the migration, as always, was not as, as smooth as expected because the progress got stuck at 99%. But finally, it worked out. And then they performed automated data validation by sending a small percentage of reads to both databases because the old Cassandra was still running. And then they compared the results and everything looked great. Both databases were able to store identical information. So as a result, they managed to go down from 177 Cassandra nodes to just 72 SillaDB nodes. Their tail latencies also increased or improved dramatically. For example, fetching historical messages had a P99 of between 40 and 120 milliseconds on Cassandra, but with SillaDB having a nice and chill 15 milliseconds of P99 latency. What exactly is P99 latency? Well, it's also known as the 99th percentile, and it's a statistical measurement used to analyze data and understand performance of response times. For example, in the context of response times for a web service, the P99 value represents the maximum time it takes for the 99% of the request to be processed successfully. And a fun fact, is that at the end of the migration, the Discord team was watching the World Cup and were able to observe the spikes in the number of messages during the final match. So what are my personal learnings from this journey? Well, turns out sharding and partitioning have to be very well thought through from the early stages. And also, well, it turns out that Cassandra, even if it's designed for large data, it's very important to carefully design the data model optimize data access patterns when you're reading the data and leverage Cassandra's features approximately to ensure optimal read performance. Also minimizing the need for complex ad hoc read queries and focusing on denormalized data models aligned with the application's access patterns is a good practice in Cassandra. Also an additional layer of load balancing or caching as Discord did also always helps to achieve higher results with sharding and partitioning. And of course, migrate what you can first, but also make sure that you always finish the migration because if you don't intend to finish migration, it's better not to start it. And last but not least, never forget to monitor the result.